Welcome to the OC Bitches. Welcome to the OC Bitches. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing great. How are you doing, Melinda? I'm doing fantastic. I'm doing really, 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 really well. And I've been waiting for our guest for a while on this ep- on this podcast that we um, are all coming to love doing and love reconnecting with people. And if we didn't do this podcast, we I don't know that I'd be able to have this conversation with all of these cool people that we're having conversations with. So why don't I actually introduce, we are doing episode 24, The Proposal, and... We are so pleased and excited to welcome our guest today. Born in New Zealand, this fine actor of stage and screen has been in pretty much everything. I mean, from over um, 1,100 episodes of the Australian drama Neighbors to ER, X-Files, Ugly Betty, Lost, Entourage, Once Upon a Time, Indiana Jones, and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, The Girl in the Dragon Tattoo. Oh my gosh, I love this one. Spam a lot. And for the past four seasons, Dynasty, you are... I'll know him as Caleb Nickel, or Cal to Julie, dad to Kirsten, grandpa to Seth, and one half of the gruesome twosome to Sandy. Welcome, Alan Dale. <laughs> Production, thank you very much. Hey. Production. You. I have so much fun it doing so these. It is so nice yeah. to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's really great with introductions. Yeah. I have to yeah. give it up to Melinda. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's so nice yeah. to see you, Alan. Thank you for My coming pleasure, on Rachel. and being here with us. My pleasure, Rachel. <laughs> And also, you're sitting in a very cool-looking house, I have to say. Yeah, it's, everyone. it's a, an odd thing that happened. Um, when we first came over here to do the pilot, it was freezing cold. It was March. And I thought, oh, fancy having to live here. And I thought, it's okay. We're just doing a pilot for a remake of Dynasty. No one's going to want it, so we'll be right. But then they picked it up. And um, and I, I rented a house on the lake which was very clever, except it was a long way away and I have an electric car, so that became a problem. <laughs> I got very lonely sitting out there by the lake. And then one day this house came up for sale on, on, on Zillow, I think it was, and um, we, I just loved it, so we bought it. It's very cool looking, so I... Well, it's available. If you, I've just finished on <laughs> Dynasty, so we're going to rent it out. It's got everything. Yeah. Oh, so, really? Yeah, so if you're working over here... Yeah, Atlanta is one of those cities that you can, you really do have to, you have to drive everywhere. There's, it's not like you can take, um, yes, you have to, um, locations can be very far distance. And when you purchase a home there, I think it's, they usually tend to be um, in the suburbs. Yeah, only this is Midtown. It's a funny oh. thing. Oh. Um, yeah, which is right near the High Museum and things. And it's, it's quite an arty place. Oh, really? Who would have thought? There you are. <laughs> Yeah. Well, so you've been working on Dynasty. I have. For four seasons. Four seasons, yes. In fact, you know, when I was working on the OC, the thing that I didn't think when I left my home um, in New Zealand and came to America via Australia, that I'd end up living within a mile of my studio. I (laughs) thought I was coming to Hollywood. But in the (laughs) end, you know, one time Trace borrowed the car for the day and she forgot to pick me up. So I walked home, you know, it was only a mile. So, oh, a, wow. A, yeah. But ever since then, I've been, in, I've been in Cape Town and here and Vancouver and, you know, you know what it's like. You know? <laughs> so we were very spoiled when we were doing the OC. But, so you lived in Manhattan Beach before we started shooting the OC. So you were, yeah, and we, yeah. which is exactly where our studio was. And that, that is definitely how big Los Angeles is. That is very lucky because we talk a lot about the traffic getting to that studio on this podcast. So you're very lucky. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, you guys were sensible. You were living sort of in the Hollywood Hills and that sort of thing. So, you know, <laughs> I, I, I just I can't stand being away from the beach. So... We found we found uh, Hermosa Beach and then moved to Manhattan. And Hermosa, I was watching a couple of the um, the blogs where people were saying you went, couldn't remember where you went on the bus that night. It was Hermosa Beach, Pier Avenue, that you went to. I I, I wasn't part of that gang when we first discovered that we were popular. Remember? Oh we all yeah, got on the bus that was Hermosa. Hermosa. And Beach, we kept saying yeah, Redondo. Goes, yeah. Or Manhattan. Okay. We were all over the place. <laughs> yeah. But it was, and I remember, you know, you, the work the next day, everyone was just flabbergasted at how many people turned up. Yeah, that was definitely our aha moment, as we've been saying. Um, yeah. It was pretty unbelievable and also very cool at the same time at yeah. Hermosa Beach. Thank you for giving us that answer. <laughs> <laughs> you bring up a good point that you were you were a part of our show from the very beginning. You were there as as everyone was experiencing this very 
you know, huge show getting a lot of attention. And I'm really interested to hear your side of your, your perception of, you know, what was going on, um, you know, the kids experiencing all of this fame and, and what your perception of all that was. Yeah. Well, I, because I'd been through Neighbours, which you mentioned earlier on, in Australia, where you know I did, I was there for eight and a half years. That's a mistake. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I had seen a lot of young people come along, have some success, be treated like superstars because we always are on these sets and things. People look after us and you know stroke our egos and and everything. And um, you know I've seen a lot of young people do that, and then they are written out of the series and. Suddenly, they're not treated like that again. They, so they desperately get out to the set again to see their old friends, and nobody sort of takes much notice because they're busy trying to look after the next new batch of people that have come through. So I was a little concerned, because having seen all of that, and I never forget sitting talking to Ben um, one night and saying, giving him a bit of a lecture about, about making sure he didn't get too big for his boots. We were sitting on a private jet flying to, um, <laughs> to, to Las Vegas, if you'll recall. And um, I was saying, now, don't get carried away with this. <laughs> <laughs> but, hey, everyone seems to have stayed pretty stable and mm-hmm. done well. Yeah, for sure, I think. <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> well, you have. have. Oh, well, you thanks. Have. <laughs> <laughs> All we can be. All we can say is what about ourselves, I guess. Yeah. It so, was such fun. Yeah. So you, how did the OC come about for you? It, well, I could tell you the long story, but I won't. I'll tell you the short story. I, I, um, I was at the Comic Con in San Diego because of my character in um, Star Trek Nemesis um, who made a speech in the Senate. And um, while he was making the speech, a, blue, a green light, came out of a box and, and filled the Senate with this light and then everything turned to stone and I fell over and shattered on the floor and then the opening credits started. So that's how big my part was. And um, <laughs> uh, they invited me down to Comic-Con to sign autographs and I sat there all day and not many people came and asked for autographs. Um, but then my phone rang about 6 o'clock at night and it was my manager saying that um, uh, I'd been asked if I would come in and do the, just one scene in this new series that they were doing called the OC. So that's that's how it started. So on Monday, that was Friday night, Monday morning, I was there with you guys and um, did, you know, expecting to do a scene and they painted me bright orange, which I can sort of see why now. <laughs> <laughs> we were just oh, yeah. saying this in the last episode. I ended up with orange hair, an orange shirt, and orange skin, and it was just a lot of um, very tragic um, choices, I think. <laughs> well, it is Orange County, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> but when you started the OC, you like you said, you'd already had many, many years of work in Australia. And what made you decide to come over and and come to the US? And what I mean, after you'd had so much success yeah. in Australia? Yeah, well, I was I was about your age actually when I came. So mm-hmm. it was just um, it was I had. The, car- the, the show Neighbours was huge all over the world. It was it competed through the 80s to be number one in the world with mm-hmm. Dallas and I think probably Dynasty. Oh, yeah. um, um, and uh, so I was really recognisable in Australia and in Britain um, and that wasn't good, you know, so mm-hmm. I, I, I wasn't getting a lot of other work so I was doing voiceovers and things to make a living. And um, I did a, one of the runaway production shows called First Daughter, which where we used the Sydney Town Hall as the White House and we, we had, um, it, was, it was a silly thing for our ABC, I think it was. And, um, and I just thought, look, um, why don't I go to America and do a proper American show where I get paid American money mm. instead of Australian money? <laughs> so um, we just decided to come and have a look and we did and, um, and then we liked it. We liked Hollywood. It's funny because everyone had bagged L.A., all of my life, everywhere all over the world, they hated it, you know, and things. But we loved it, and we still do, you know. It's a great city. And um, so we thought, why not? So we just came. That's all. You make a good point. Of it. You've, na- you've mentioned so many different places that you've either had to move for work or usually we move for work. And do you ever get tired of being a gypsy? I think that's for all of us. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. I was talking to Trace about it earlier, you know, that we're all, you know, we... We ships passing in the night, you know, 
we don't get to know each other that well. You know, we work together all week, so you don't really want to spend the weekend together. So you, you know, you, and then, then, then the show's over and you go. And, you know, so it's only just a few people like obviously YouTube, you know, who keep in touch, but, um, uh, that sort of happens a lot. It's just the nature of the job. And if you love it, you know, if you love doing it, um, I used to do it for nothing. You know, I, I was an amateur actor for years before I, you know, started getting paid and, uh, so, yeah, so I don't have any desire to retire or stop doing it. So that means we're going to have to be nomadic. That's just the way it is. Yeah, it is interesting how, well, you know, in certain cases you do become family with the people you work with, but then it's like the show ends and you might never speak to them again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I, no offense meant at all. It's just, you know, you're moving no, on yeah. and you start a new show with a whole new group of people to get to <laughs> know and and things and, you know, it's... Yeah, I, I wouldn't have guessed that that's the way it was, but you're right. It's Yeah, yeah it's, it's an interesting like process. Mm. <laughs> you came to the States, you know, and, and what I want to know is how did you perfect your American accent so well? <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, and the fact is, when I listen to because I've been watching a bit of it now because I was coming on the show, so I better have a look because I hadn't looked at it since I was in it, you know, I mean, years and years. Um and I can hear the New Zealand accent coming out all the time. <laughs> so, oh, really? You know, I, don't think, I don't think it's that good, but it's all right, you know, and people, you know, they put up with it. Plus, I've been, I've actually just been being a, a Kiwi butler in Dynasty, so I haven't had to do an American accent for a while. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you bring up something that was catching up on your resume, Alan. I've, you've never, ever, ever stopped working. And then I noticed at some points you were doing more than one show, even during the OC. So you either are the best agent in town or you just never say no, or you just somehow worked it out. Were you tired? Did you, I mean, how did you do that? How do you keep that drive? And how did that work out? Because, yeah, <laughs> it's impressive. Well, if you're not going forward, you're not going backwards. So you end up going backwards. So I, I, I just, I tend to do that. I tend to say yes to everything, mm -hmm. you know, because in Australia, you know, there wasn't a lot of everything to say no to, you know, you, you, if you got a part, you were lucky. That was it. And I actually, until I got to America and looked back, I didn't realize quite how small the industry was that I'd had, you know, a good run in. And, um, so I tended to do that. But plus I, I was really lucky because I was offered, you know, shows like Entourage and, um, Lost and, um, 24 and things like that when I was doing other things and they're pretty good shows mm -hmm. so it's hard to say no to <laughs> yeah <laughs> definitely mm. yeah so when you were on the OC do you remember what it was like where, do you have any like you know memories or anecdotes of what it was like working with certain people on the show other than telling Ben not to you know <laughs> <laughs> we try to be honest and very transparent here yes, like were I we was i that. a diva who was silly <laughs> because everyone no, I think, yeah i do think it was a bit it was a bit hard for you because you were very young and suddenly you had this old dude you had to sort of be you know i mean hell the guy you were making love to when i turned up he was what was he 15 <laughs> 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 oh, look, no, I don't think that's ever. Um, that I never. I always loved working with you, and oh, and it, you. and in fact, it's very. It's always so rewarding. I always come come with an attitude of I want to work with good actors that elevate my performance. Working with you and working with Peter, there were some you know sometimes working with kids, not not you, Rachel, <laughs> but working with some people. <laughs> But no, there are times when it's like, okay, I've got to adjust you, move, you're in my light, or you're not hitting your mark or something. But there's just, um, from a very young age, I was very aware of getting what I can learn, taking what I can learn from people who are proficient at their craft. And we always had, I, I thought we always had some great scenes. Now, off camera, I don't think people ever, we get to see you once in this episode, smile, and they make a joke about it. But you were <laughs> always giggling and telling jokes and have, and we had a lot of fun. That that's Those are my memories off, off set or yeah, in between yeah, takes. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I, he's, you know, Caleb was probably my favorite character I ever played, apart really? from King Arthur and Spamalot. Um, oh, I want to uh, hear about that too. <laughs> yeah, that was. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, Caleb, but Caleb was such fun because he was just, you know, he was just naughty. You know, he was just a naughty boy, really. And if he could be nasty, he would. 
And, you know, he just thoroughly enjoyed himself all the time. And it was, I really enjoyed playing him, I have to admit. It was, I was sad when that, that sort of came to an end. But then I was lucky because almost immediately I got, um, what was it? Ugly Betty, yeah. Mm. And then that ended and then I got this invitation to go to London for six months to do Spamalot, which was, oh. I love, oh. I'm such a Monty Python fan and I've seen the production uh, and the I had no idea that you got to play Arthur in Spamalot in the West End. To me, that must be the most rewarding thing singing dancing yeah. on stage yeah. instant gratification there's like you couldn't give more of yourself right no and well and the other thing about that show it ends with a huge wedding and um they drop you know large this size confetti on everybody in the <laughs> audience uh yeah. and the, and the people are roaring and then it's then the, then it's time for them to give me a standing ovation and i did every night because they were standing because they were having such fun yeah, I mean, I, when I, I I was it was interesting because I finished doing Ugly Betty, went out to Australia to do a series called Sea Patrol for a few months, and while I was there, I got the call from London asking if I'd go and do Spamalot, and that was a new production just started in Melbourne in Australia, so we went to see it, and I remember talking to Trey, leaning across to Trace about. Oh, 20 minutes in, I said, the trouble with shows like this is you laugh so much at the beginning, you know, you sort of run out towards the end. But that didn't happen. I just about lost a lung that night. I just had such fun. I, I've uh, given Trace the instructions that w don't, I don't care who's doing it, if the local school were doing it, if there's a Spamalot performance, I want to go and see it. I did that <laughs> 120 times or something. It was just marvellous fun every night. I'm just, I'm just like, I'm tickled because I did a lot of musical theatre when I was when I was a teenager and I just never had more fun and I wish I'd been able to do it more. I just didn't think I was um, a sing. I, I don't know. I don't think my singing talent was I up to snuff. I heard you were a soprano. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I trained I some. I did like, you yeah. know, Maria and West Side Story and that kind of stuff. But oh, You yeah. did? That's a big deal. Would you just, just throw that in there? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Por favor, Anita, make the neck lower. <laughs> yes, of course. I think they just remade that, didn't they? Oh my gosh, it's coming out, Spielberg! Ah, I'm all excited about all that right. one. Yeah, that's going to be, be very good. exciting. Yeah, a bunch of musical theater nerds. Here. Shaving is suddenly enjoyable again with Billy. Yes, it's now part of my daily self care routine. Billy is the best razor out there for those days when you want an extra smooth shave. No pink tax. No visit to the drugstore. No breaking the bank. You can go to mybilly.com to get their starter kit for just $9. It's so affordable and includes their award-winning razor, two refill blades, and a cult favorite magnetic holder. I love my Billy razor, and used with that shaving cream, it literally is the best, the closest, no-cut shave that I have ever had. I am just so excited that I don't have to rush to the waxing place. Every week, <laughs> now that I have Billy, it really gives the smoothest shave. They're an Allure Best of Beauty winner and on Nylon's beauty hit list for a reason. And to express a little love for our show, go to mybilly.com slash OC. It's a small way you can support us while getting the best razor you will ever own. It's just $9 to get your starter kit plus free shipping always. Go to mybilly.com slash OC, spelled my B I L L I E dot com slash OC. Staying up to date on the latest love triangle on the OC can work up an appetite. Well, Grubhub's got you covered. And Grubhub makes game day in my house easy. We order online and our pizza shows up hot and fresh, and it keeps me out of the kitchen. It's a no brainer. Grubhub really saves me on school nights. My daughter doesn't get home until four o'clock and it is hard to plan dinner. So Grubhub having everything delivered, whatever we want, and even to surprise my daughter has just been so much fun. And Grubhub is so great because they have a level of respect and care for the restaurants they deliver from. They work hard to serve restaurants so they can serve you. Today, Grubhub's doing a little extra to serve Panera. Get a free delivery perk on your first order from Panera of $15 or more. Order through the Grubhub app or online. Grubhub, we serve restaurants. Today we're discussing uh, a very important episode, The Proposal, which you're a very pivotal part of this episode, Alan. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I, I watched it just the other day. and Yeah. 
he, he wasn't very nice, though, was he, to Misha? No, it wasn't nice. <laughs> well, we'll get into that. But All I'm right. just going to give our listeners a, okay. a little synopsis on what we're dealing with today. The uh, the Balboa Lighthouse is almost open, but a major roadblock, the loss of their liquor license, stands to ruin it all. Luke is leaving Newport, but first wants forgiveness from Marissa. When neither she nor Julie will talk to him, he drinks too much and nearly dies. Caleb proposes to Julie to make her happy, strikes a deal with Marissa. Strikes a deal. Mm -hmm. Seth and Summer undergo a massive home repair project to make Marissa feel more at home at Jimmy's. Directed by Helen Shaver, written by Liz Friedman and Josh Schwartz. Episode 24, The Proposal. I think this, I, I actually saw this episode described as the episode that destroyed everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I thought, I wonder what this is about exactly. So I just think it's an interesting, this, this marriage and this union of these two people and being completely oblivious and not caring and the ripple effect of their actions on all of these characters is, um, it's pretty um, epic in this one, don't you think? I, I love the way that your character just, if when, when Caleb asks you to get married, you just say, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, you're I like, know. Kiki. Yeah. Yeah. Kiki. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very fun episode for both of you, for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, the episode opens with Seth, Summer, Marissa, and Ryan at the movies. Uh, which really was really cute because, Wasn't you know, it? the movie, yeah, the movie ends, Mar Marissa's bawling her eyes out. <laughs> so is Seth. So is Seth. <laughs> <laughs> which was, like, really cute. Um, and then, you know, the credits on the screen were showing names of our crew, right? I feel like I saw Jamie Barber. Right, right, because everybody wanted to know, like, what's this, Autumn Leaves is playing, which is one of my favorite old songs, and and I, everyone wanted to, f I was like, what is the movie? And it turns out that it's a shout out to our crew members. Yeah. <laughs> Just the credits. I was, tr I was trying to figure out the movie <laughs> as I'm rewatching it, yeah. and I see Jamie Barber's name, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I didn't notice that. Gosh, I'll go back and have another look. <laughs> That's also a beautiful old theater called the Warner Grand in San Pedro. Do you remember shooting there, Rachel? I do. I actually remember it vividly, uh, shooting there in San Pedro. And I remember the across the street, you know, the, the kids go to Jamba Juice mm -hmm. uh, after. And I remember it was directly across the street from where we were filming. And it was like this promenade of, of shops and stuff. Mm hmm um down in san pedro and and i remember at the time there was like a dog adoption going on or something like a dog fair and i almost like went home with three dogs <laughs> that's my memory of uh shooting down in san pedro but there's also some really you know the scenes that are going on in this location when the kids leave the movie theater and everyone's being so protective of marissa they're like worried you know any little thing is going to set her off because who knows what this with this one and you see luke sitting there and Julie is approaching to meet him in the cutest bucket hat, by the way. And bucket <laughs> hats are back in fashion once again. So good for you. I love that she's <laughs> being incognito with a hat, but she's got a her low cut shirt like down to her <laughs> belly button. Like she's still, but you know what? It's so you know I can't believe just how flat out mean Julie's being to Luke, and. You know, not taking any responsibility, not like, honey, I'm sorry, but can we do it this way? It's just, I just blocked you from my buddy list. She's just venomous, like not taking responsibility at, at all. Very unlikable, uh, to say the least. Yeah, the ma maternal instincts, I would say, are not Julie's uh, strong no. point. <laughs> no. <laughs> For sure. Uh, but, you know, the four of the kids, like, they, of course, walk there right as Julie is sitting there with Luke and Marissa sees them together. And here we go. <laughs> yeah. Poor Marissa. I mean, really, it, 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 when everyone's walking on eggshells around her and poor Luke and, and I don't know, what, what is it about these adults? Alan, we've been watching this show. You know, when I was shooting it, I was just reveling in how nasty she was. And now yes. as, as, as we've gotten older and, and my daughter's 21 and I'm like, I can't believe, ah. and we're shouting at the screen. And, and so I'm, I'm right there with the audience with that. But, but the next day when Seth walks in on Ryan, I don't know why this was such a, this funny, like questioning Seth's masculinity 
and he makes it awkward that he sees Ryan in <laughs> taking off of a shirt and he's like, do you work out? Not really cool. Me neither. I'm going to go watch some hockey. I mean, it's just this funny like through line. That's like, I just feel like this is Josh's or he, he has said that Seth he's, is his voice to get through the show. Right. Right. He's really emasculating Seth a lot in this episode. He's like, all right, I'll watch football. It's like, uh, football's not for four months. All right, I'll watch hockey. Yeah, it's over. It's like, he just can't get it right. Well, it's also... Oh, poor Seth. Yeah, we're making a point of this is this being Luke's last episode. You know, he's leaving. Right. And, um, and... and Yeah, he shows up to tell Seth and Ryan that he's moving to Portland. Yeah. Uh, it, was nice. it was a not very nice performance by him. Oh, I it agree. was really lovely, right? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Chris Carmack really, really was amazing yeah. in this episode. He always is, but like he really gave it his he all. Did. And yeah. Yeah. It was I was very impressed. Mm. Absolutely. Do you, do you guys remember Helen Schaefer? Sha- Shaver? She's a she's a the director. The director. I remember. Yeah. yeah. She's gone on to direct so many things, and I remember. You know, we don't we didn't get a lot of female directors. I think we had like three for the whole series. And really. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So she's an actress, or she was, is still, and she's still directing big things. So I, I just remember being very welcoming to a female director. Little, yeah. little, little trip yeah. tip yeah, on the side. For sure. Probably wouldn't have affected me as much. <laughs> but I knew what you mean. Yes. I don't yeah. remember, to be honest, but that's largely because I don't remember a lot of things. <laughs> um, do you remember much about this episode i mean i mean of course we all have our different experiences and things that we you know sometimes we remember certain things or and or things are just jogged our memories are jogged watching this yes but did you have well, that like a that, lot of that yeah. yeah watching the well i haven't i hadn't watched it at all since i mm-hmm. well since we finished the show um in, in fact um in the four years what well, two years ago um i was at a in a backyard party here in, in Atlanta and who should walk through the door but Peter Gallagher. Oh. So, you know, that was the first time I'd had anything to do with anything, you know, um, uh, OC-ish <laughs> since I finished doing the show, you know. And uh, <laughs> so it was lovely to see him. He, he's a lovely fellow. He's and, so um, yeah. Yeah, he really is such a talent too. But again, see, that's the thing. People don't talk about it much, but it really is that what, what a talent, what a group of people. To put together it really worked you know every scene there was no you didn't ever think the people weren't the characters you know what i mean uh, mm-hmm. it just was really beautifully done that's what we're discovering on this this podcast because we're interviewing you know norman buckley and matt ramsey our editors and deborah fisher our writers and we're and the all of the people that made this show what it is because when you think about it it really is such a magical moment when any show gets a film gets made a tv show gets made and everything that goes into it so that the audience can actually hit play or just turn on the channel and watch it it's it's really rewarding for us to get to understand all of those aspects and why this show was a success and why it really affected a lot of people and had that and had that cultural phenomenon. The um, editors, I, I've only ever in my life once done this. I actually, I watched the, an episode. I don't even remember which one it was, um, but I had a quite a poignant scene in it, and um, I hadn't, being a, an actor in soaps, which is what I'd done, what Neighbours was. You know, they used to say, you know, don't pause, don't pause, don't pause. I'll change and watch the news on the other channel. Don't pause. No pauses, you know. So I, 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 it's not, I don't do lots of Dewey pauses in my, um, in my acting. But in one scene I should have, and the editors took the wide shot, the medium, and the close-up and ran them all one after the other so that I left enough space because I, I, I hadn't left enough space. And the scene was magic the way they did it. But I had that wasn't my doing; it was theirs, you know. So I, I remember running upstairs when, at work the next day just to find them, just to say, "Wow," because I I hadn't thought of taking the time, but they did, and they found footage, you know, to make to take the time, which was magic. Yeah, I mean, editors are truly phenomenal. I've I've really learned 
you know, you learn to appreciate so much because you don't really, or I didn't ever really know, you know, what they did and how much went into it. But learning it, you're like, oh, you're like the magicians behind the curtain that actually make it all work. And it's truly a craft and a gift. And I, I would love to just sit in on a editing session. (laughs) They do that, um, that thing of they're looking for the happy accidents that most art, great art comes from, you know, and, um, Mm -hmm. And uh, they find them and, you know, and pop them in the places that make it magic. But anyway, I just think there were a lot of fine actors as well that gave them the material on the OC. It was just, it was a cut above a soap, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. it's described as a soap, but it really was a cut above that. And we were just learning. Even Josh has said, you know, he was just, they were doing, Josh and Stephanie have said, they, they were doing what they like, whether it was the music or the meta humor. Uh, yeah, just, well, yeah, I, yeah it's, it's, I think on one of the other um, episodes of your show I, I watched, uh, they talked about the music being another character. I, I agree. Mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm. it was astounding, the music at the time. I mean, a lot of shows do that now, so it doesn't stand out as much. But at the time, it was really, the music was fabulous. And in this episode yeah. in particular, the music is my weak point, uh, so I'm trying to educate myself. But in this episode, I definitely noticed... And we'll talk about that when we get to those scenes. But um, I do want to say that when we go into the Cohen kitchen and Sandy gets this letter, well, first of all, sorry, the Jimmy and Sandy handshake, and it's yes. kind of adorable, dorky, <laughs> white boy handshake. <laughs> I just saw it because Peter and Tate giggled so much on that set. I mean, it was a, just a laugh a minute in between takes. Do you remember when we'd have those big scenes, Alan, in the in the kitchen? Yeah. And half the time in between takes, it was just like stand-up mayhem. comedy, right? <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was mayhem. mayhem. Yes, it, was, it was. Yeah, it was just fun. It was a time. It was a wonderful time, I have to admit, um, with crazy things like flying to Las Vegas in a private <laughs> jet. I mean, my goodness. <laughs> was what were you flying for, do you remember? It was a... Um, like a billboard chart award, something. No, we were going there to shoot, shoot scenes. Well, I think oh, you went, been, oh, the episode, the strip coming be, up. Yeah, that'll be that. Oh. Yeah. That's coming up. Yeah, we have a guest for that one. Oh. Mm-hmm. That's in, yeah, that's like two away, I think. Yeah, that's that's so Caleb's batch, quote bachelor party. That right, he's like, like they're yeah. forcing, yes. And, and this is one of those things like there, there was, a, especially in the beginning, there was a lot of things that Caleb was doing behind the scenes that the audience wasn't aware of. He was probably mm. the most enigmatic character of, of all. You know, we know that Julie's a gold digger. We know she's a narcissist. She know, we know that she's sleeping around. But, but Caleb's just really mysterious. There's a lot of shit going on behind the scenes with this guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, in the storyline in this where, you know, so their liquor license gets revoked at the restaurant uh, with Sandy. And, and I actually like, I know that I'm jumping forward a bit, but I like that Sandy goes to Caleb for help. And that has never happened before, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, and he, it, it wasn't voluntary. I mean, he didn't want to. Right. Oh, yeah, he's kicking and screaming, but yes. I just, you know. Yeah. Right, and when he says, like, I did a favor for you, and Caleb goes, no, I'm holding it over your head. I want you to, you know. <laughs> he does it. Of course. But, he, but he's totally honest. <laughs> and, and, but, and, I, and, and to that point, Sandy and Caleb, I really love your scenes together. It gives so much texture and so much drama and... And I, too, was disappointed when Caleb... I'm sorry, guys. Spoiler alert. Our podcast, we talk about things all over because I know some people get upset. But I, I too, thought it was um, it was not a good choice that Caleb wasn't with us anymore. But Well, it's all right. It's okay because it's I mean, we're, uh, the same creator. Um, I've just had him <laughs> have him do the same thing to me just now. <laughs> oh, wait. Okay, so can I ask you this? Because I did see this. How many characters of yours have had fatal heart attacks? Many. Uh, many. And it depends entirely, <laughs> many. In fact, they were going to do that on Dynasty, but I did say to them, you know, if you do that, you do realize that I'll have to actually carry the book of um, Guinness Book of Records in my hand when I'm dying because I think I would have to be the person who's had the most heart attacks on TV. I must be. <laughs> so they, 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 it took me, I had to go back to them three times before they would agree to kill me some other way. 
So are you officially, um, may I ask, are you officially dead on Dynasty? Or are you coming? I am. Yes, I, I've oh. been dead for some months. Okay. <laughs> you I look keep, great. <laughs> I, keep, I keep coming back as a ghost. But you're, so your character, but will you continue to work on the show as, oh, you're coming back as a ghost? Or are you done with the show? I've done now. Oh, okay. I spent the, I spent, I spent the last six months being a ghost. Okay. Okay. Being very wise. Okay. Mm. Because I, I, I noticed that there was like a Reddit discussion about you leaving. <laughs> Just so you know. Yeah, what was that? Oh, well. <laughs> no, well, just I like, because that. I, you know, we, we're, I'm catching up on, on what you've been doing so I can, right, so I course. can be in the yeah. know and, and, of and course. the fans want to know, like, what's going yeah. on? Did well, I looked at t- what you guys have been doing and you, you and I were in entourage at the same time. Right. We had Doug Ellen on an episode. He was a huge fan of the OC. So he came on for one of our episodes and, and talked about Oliver and our disdain for Oliver. But yes. All oh, right. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, it, there, yeah. He, there's quite a few people um, from the OC on Entourage. And you got to do the film as well, right? I did, yes. I, I didn't get to, that. W- <laughs> didn't you? Oh. That's okay. I had to walk through Warner Brothers' lot, the whole lot, walking. <laughs> that was the, and then they kept cutting away, you see, and cutting back, and we were still walking. You, you yeah, were the I, head of Warner know. Brothers. You were the Peter Roth yeah. of Warner Brothers, yeah. our boss. For all of these shows. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, could, I could never have done it, really. But, yeah, I, I love to play those characters, like doctors and lawyers, all the intelligent people. I play those people. <laughs> I play them well. Thank you. <laughs> I want my nails to look good, but I don't always have time to go to the nail salon. Thankfully, Olive in June has been my savior. Yes, I cannot believe I'm now actually doing my own nails at home. With Olive and June's Manny system, you have every single tool. A nail clipper, file, buffer, cuticle serum, and more. I especially love the cleanup brush because, you know, without it, my nails can look like my daughter did them for me. This last year, CG, my daughter, and I really got into doing like a Manny Petty spa day at home. And having that whole system made it so easy and fun. And she loved the gorgeous colors, too. She took some with her back to college. <laughs> My daughter, she's only six, and she has already tried to steal the kit from me. I'm like, you don't even know what these tools do. But she recognizes quality and something really great when she sees it. The Olive and June Manny system just makes sense. I used to spend $35 just for a gel manicure. And then when you include the tip, it just adds up. If you get the Olive and June Manny system with six polishes, it breaks down to just $2 a Manny. Getting beautiful Salon Perfect Nails at home is now finally achievable with Olive and June. Visit oliveandjune.com slash OC and use code OC for 20% off your first Manny system. This is an exclusive offer you can only get here. That's O-L-I-V-E-A-N-D-J-U-N-E dot com slash OC. Code OC for 20% off your first Manny system. oliveandjune.com slash OC. Code OC. Is your ex still using your Netflix? That's what one woman found out after she downloaded Truebill, which finds and cancels subscriptions with just a tap. This is genius. Truebill is an app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply have forgotten about. On average, people save up to $720 per year with Truebill. Because companies make subscriptions hard to cancel, Truebill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your accounts and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap. I love this. I recently found out that I was subscribing to an app that I accidentally downloaded just a few months ago. I had no idea that I'd done that. Also, you know, if you ever try those free trials and the next thing you know you've been paying a recurring service, use Truebill. Yeah, I mean, there are so many subscriptions I'm not even aware of, especially for my daughter's school. I'll subscribe to something just to buy one thing, and then it's still going on. And of course, I have no recollection of it, and it would just go on forever without Truebill. Don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash OC. Go right now. Truebill.com slash OC. It could save you hundreds a year. That's Truebill.com slash OC. So, guys, you know... We're not talking about something very important in this episode. Right. Yes. Right. What? Summer Summer has the idea to remodel Marissa's room. This Hello. is important. This is very important. It's very so important. adorable. Very important stuff. No, I actually really liked this storyline in the show uh, where Summer recruits Seth to help her yeah. redo the room. 
By the way, what they accomplish in like, I don't know, a day and a half? Miracle. It's a miracle. I mean, it's a <laughs> TV magic, I tell you. But I was very impressed. And it's funny because there's... When they're in there and they have the tools, and again, it's showing Seth that he doesn't know what he's doing, and he's like, I can just pay people to do this. That reminds me of Josh Schwartz. <laughs> just pay people to do it. I'm not doing it myself. Uh, um, there's like, I'm holding up these tools as we're mm-hmm. working, and over the years, I have seen this pop up as a as a GIF, a GIF. How the hell do you pronounce is, that? Is Whatever. it a GIF, you, you know, guys? Those, yeah. And then, you know, it's in... It's pretty funny. Like I, it's a famous anyway, it one. I've seen see it. it. Yeah, yeah. In this scene, I was like, "Oh, that's what this is from." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's so playful and it's really sweet, and I liked that storyline. And also, Marissa and Ryan rekindling is happening. They have their first kiss that they've had in a while. That happens at the top of the episode on the pier. Um, and I had all the feels. Right, and that's where that's where Pride by Syntax was playing. And as they were kissing, and he said, we haven't done this in a while, I was like, you're right, they haven't done this in a while. And of course, yeah. she's. we have to do the shout out to the Newport Balboa Bar, those famous ice cream bars that she's... I thought it was a Balboa Bar, <laughs> right. the ice cream. That was miraculously not melting, and she wasn't eating it and just holding it. Yeah, I noticed that. That was a miracle. It was An- another TV miracle, <laughs> but I am noticing. You know how the fans were always like, "Ah, oh, Ryan and Marissa, they're getting, they're they're apart, and they're getting back together." And I was like, "Well, so in the last one, when he re- rescues her from, you know, out in Chino, and I was like, when did they officially just get back together? You know, it was, you know, it wasn't like, hey, are we doing this? They just did. They just got back together. There was no discussion, which is kind of, I guess, you know, I guess I, yeah." They must have discussed it off screen. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stuff that goes on <laughs> off screen. But, but Rachel, this scene where you're saying you don't like hardware stores, you cry during chick flicks. Next thing you're going to tell me you you walk in on Ryan changing, ha ha. But <laughs> this, Alan, do you remember Rachel and Adam used to kind of talk like that? Their yes. banter reminds me of that yes. in real life. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Yes, it was seamless. Did we? Yes. I yes. mean, talking shit is definitely my specialty, but <laughs> oh, good that's fun. funny. Yeah, Adam, I can see like we're having a lot of fun in these scenes. Uh, I think that but- also has an effect on a show, doesn't it? I, um, you know, I have worked on shows where people don't get sort of close, but you know, really everyone, from whether it be in the makeup trailer all the way through to you know, on the set, everything really. Everyone was just having a good time. Mm-hmm. You know, that we had our moments. There were issues, but um, what issues, Alan? Do, oh, we talked. Yeah, tell. do tell. <laughs> Ra- Rachel told. Have any issues to share? Rachel told <laughs> Tate that she was sorry for being a little asshole, which I don't. <laughs> I was like. <laughs> and I was like, I don't. Were, think- were you a little asshole specifically <laughs> to him, or you, do you mean just generally? Yeah, just Tate because he deserved it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, there was just rumors, you know, that Tate had said the kids were kind of, you know, assholes, essentially. And I was like, well, if I ever was a little asshole, I'm sorry. (laughs) Oh, wow. Well, he didn't ever say that to me. (laughs) Yeah. But I remember because he because he he and I ended up like nothing that we did, but we ended up uh, replacing each other. Like so he was written out when I was written in and then I was written out and he was written back in. But along the way, he became a director, and now he directs mm. all sorts of wonderful things. Yes. But, yes. So it wasn't a bad thing for him. I didn't think of it. I asked, I said, what was it like when they told you, you know, that you weren't coming back? And he said he was devastated. And and I think that's yeah. when these things happen, when your characters get killed off or they don't continue writing, it's really hard not to take things personally, you know? Right. It really yeah. is. How do, well, in, king of heart attacks over there. How do I know. To how did, how did, so I was going to say, you have to get, actually get used to it eventually, you know. Mm-hmm. You just have to cop it. And then, you know, if somebody else hires you, you think, well, it can't have been because I wasn't good enough. Mm-hmm. You know? Right. You, because we're always expecting somebody to come along and tap us on the shoulder and say, okay, fun's over, joke's over, you've had your fun, off you go. Right. You know? mm-hmm. but, and well, I, so are you going to tell us about the issues you were referring to? <laughs> or are we just glazing over that? <laughs> we're gla- glazing over. T- spill the tea. I'm, how I'm how bitchy was I? <laughs> Never. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Enough about me. What do you think of me? Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, no, not saying anything more. Okay, well, back to the episode. Yeah, okay. let's back, back to the episode. episode. Let's talk about you go showing up to Marissa to ask for Julie's hand in marriage. This right. was a very bold move on Caleb's part, and honestly, a bit shocking. It was a bit shocking, and I didn't really understand, understand quite why until. I think it's just later. to move the story along. I don't know. Yeah, um, it was a sort of charming thing to do in a sort yeah. of gross way. Um, um, he wasn't very charm- uncaleb like sort of but then behind it yeah i'm still wondering why caleb is asking julie like what is what are his motivations he says i love your mother and family is very important to me and is he just you know needs instant gratification or just sees something he wants because we know that he really doesn't probably love julie I'm just curious. Oh, no, I, I think he... You do? Uh, Did you play uh, Love for Love? Look in the mirror, love. Uh, I mean, you know, the, he, he, he or is was it, very it was attracted the sex. to her. Right? It mean, was the sex. But it's, yeah, sex. <laughs> no, okay. I, I, absolutely. I would. I thought that. That's how I played it anyway, um, <laughs> okay. that, that she's a real trophy. And, um, okay. you know, he he's the sort of character that likes trophies, you know. Yeah, mm-hmm. we found that, that out because he me. likes booty calls. Yeah, booty call. That wasn't, <laughs> wasn't booty call. What? Well, that booty? was a fun day for me. You know, you can you know that I haven't got a lot of hair. <laughs> I had a little bit more back then. Yeah. And I and I, but at the time I used to trim my hair with one of those um, big razor things with a spacer on, and you just go zh, 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 and things. And I had one of those, and we were doing the booty call. And I thought I better just trim my hair up, so I trimmed my hair up, and then there was a. a I'd taken the, the spacer thing off and I was just doing my eyebrows and just, you know, things. And I saw a little bit of hair up here that was wrong. And you know, I had hair right across here. So I went, zhoop, like what? that. It, and thought, holy shit, I just shaved the top of my head. <laughs> and I did. And I had to do the, the booty call scene that day. And I called my manager and said, Fuck, what do I do? Um, I've just shaved the top of my head. And he said, um, uh, um, uh, Have you told anyone? I said, No. He said, Well, say nothing. Say nothing. And who knows what will happen? Well, the first time, and I actually saw a scene the other day that I was watching, so it wasn't the first time it was done, but the first time I had been shot from above when I came to the door, they shot it from right above, right down onto the two, the two of us as you opened the door. And I'd shaved the top of my head, but no one noticed and no one said anything. And oh, so we God. just carried on and, ah, oh, I thought, I, whoa, that was a terrible fright. <laughs> that was oh, the, booty, the booty call day for me was the day I shaved the top of my head. What you don't know is we all knew and we've been talking about it ever since. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> but I still love that when I when I said, "Is this a booty call?" and you said, "What's a booty call?" and you still say it with the booty, so it, it's actually sorry was no, no, no. That's really that's what made it so organically wonderful. It because I didn't actually know that term at the time, and I don't think either one what? of us re- remember. Did no, yeah, yeah, I didn't know what yeah. it was, I but but you, no, yeah, it, it was it was a real genuine. But you said moment. it very well. Yeah. With your usual, you acted you know, like you were very familiar with them. Yes, indeed. I got yeah. familiar. Well done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> got familiar real quick. Yeah, right. I want to get to the proposal. I'm sorry, but I just need to get there. We'll, Please, we'll, 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 we can cover the other stuff because there's a lot to to cover. But Who, whose idea was it that I drop on my knee? Was that mine? You would know. <laughs> no, no clue. I want to no know clue. whose idea was it that it was an emerald. Yeah. What about a diamond? I'm not really sure who came up with it, but I, there was a discussion because I have green eyes. I yeah. don't, I have a feeling it may have been just like an aesthetic thing, but hmm. that's that's a question for, it could have been a costume thing. I do remember us having a discussion about it, but I don't know. I mean, emeralds are beautiful. I think somebody came yeah. to me and said, what do you think about an emerald? And I think I was like, that's great. That's a great idea. What do you yeah. think about it? What I do like you think? unexpected. But it had to be a 20 carat you know, right. It was yeah. very large. It was rather large. <laughs> yes, yes. So when the lighthouse opens, though, I thought it was a really, um, first of all, this is, again, the music. The Loose Caboose by Henry Mancini is from the party scene in Breakfast at Tiffany's. I didn't know that. Yeah, because I, cool. I was like, this is like the best music. What is this music? And it just gives it that kind of, you know, in Breakfast at Tiffany's, everybody's laughing and, jo- you know, and mm-hmm. it, that jovial and... 
the music gave it that kind of like, it's a party and it's going to get wacky feeling. And because <laughs> yeah. Bre- Breakfast at Tiffany's was kind of a, you know, I don't want to, I don't know if the word is wacky, eccentric, I guess could be, could be right. the term. Yeah, that's really cool. And the whole opening of this, you know, first we open on Marissa. I remember that Chanel, she's wearing a mm. Chanel dress that. With martini so glasses on it. it. Yeah, it was so cool. Oh God, yeah. I hope I'm right. I, I'm pretty sure it was a Chanel dress. Right. Um, and Seth and Summer are still on their mission. Summer's doing okay. the hand signals. And I can see, <laughs> I can, stuff. I can see myself. I remember that it was impossible for me not to laugh <laughs> while doing it. And you can like see that I'm like ready to break because it was so ridiculous, and I wanted to make it as big and ridiculous as possible. And I think I succeeded. It was pretty, pretty insane. But uh, I, re- I do remember that vividly. We're out of there, and then a lot a lot else unfolds Seth and Summer were just in rare form I mean every time hmm. this is when you guys were in your groove and every time you guys in this storyline you know and back when he even said you know you said was I mean to you and that really sweet moment and you know a talk, looking through the yearbook or just your banter and this development of your of your of your storyline it's just you guys are I smile Every time I watch you guys on, on yeah, camera I, during I this, I felt right? the same way. I, I'm I, with this episode, especially. I felt that way a lot. But sometimes the two of you would start to giggle in the scene, <laughs> and I would look and think, "No, they're really that's real. They're, they're having <laughs> they're having far too much fun there. That's not um, that's not the characters. That's them having fun." We right. did I, have fun, right? Right, right. Mm. for sure. But yes, when you do propose, yes, yep. Going down. Yep. I love that you, I said this earlier, that you're like, Kiki! Like, you like, show it. <laughs> but when, when he proposes, <laughs> yeah, when he proposes, <laughs> and he goes, will you marry me? Oh, my gosh. And, of course, Luke sees it. And here's yeah. where, oh, the, yeah. here's where the great editing comes in, where you just show every single face, and it's Haley, Jimmy, <laughs> Kirsten, Sandy, going, holy fuck. What? <laughs> Tate's reaction, Jimmy's reaction is my favorite. I actually laughed out loud. He was like, yeah, you should, you know, you should have a drink. And he's like, you know, I should have a drink. Like his whole exchange with Sandy and Kirsten is this is unraveling. And I thought just, I was really, Tate made me laugh. (laughs) And I loved Kelly in this. She goes off the deep end with this you know, monologue of how awful it is and it's worse and worse and worse. And, you know, I'm like, God, is she being overdramatic? And can't she just be happy for the gruesome twosome? I mean, I just love that she gets to do this. And she's like, the marriage is an asteroid that's hit the earth. And now we just have to wait and see what species survives. And she starts drinking her ass off. <laughs> and Ken Sandy's like, yes. oh, geez, here we go. <laughs> yep, <laughs> here we go. Julie <laughs> Cooper is her stepmom. <laughs> yeah, was, I, I, and one thing I would say about the show, I, I felt it could have gone for a, a lot more years because, you know, the, what you're talking about, they're, they're wonderful, wonderful moments that, you know, a lot of shows don't capture that stuff. It's just, it was something about yeah. it. I just thought it was really marvellous. Yeah, just me. I'm biased. Well, but hmm. you come from so many different, you come from doing traditional, I guess, dramas and doing all kinds of different genres. And I guess that's one of the things that I keep, you know, I repeat myself, but that it, it's not an original, I guess, I guess Josh has said he didn't watch teen soaps. He watched Freaks and Geeks and so-called life. And that's kind of what he based this on and which definitely gave it a different, different formula, right? right? It was a different, it was yeah. a freer form and, and, you know, just original or, you yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it was. Uh, I mean, I came in to do a scene, and um, you know, it ended up being two years, and and um, it, it was always a surprise to me. That was the thing about the show. It mm-hmm. Just it was always, you know, it could so easily have just been another soap, you know, but it just it just rose. Just something about it. And you you laughed out loud a lot, which is because it wasn't supposed to be a comedy, but it really was funny, especially Rach with you and and Adam. Goodness me. Yeah. <laughs> yes a lot of laughter mm. uh the opposite of laughter is what happens with luke in this episode when he's <laughs> drinking as we said he was very impressive his acting was on point uh poor luke 
And, you know, he crashes his car, winds up in the hospital. Marissa is finally ready to see him as she learns he's leaving forever. Um, And the scene in the hospital bed where Marissa and Ryan both say bye to Luke, I cried. Mindy, Mm -hmm. yes, you can attest that I always cry, but... I cried in this one, too. You did? Yes, because I don't always cry, but I did. (laughs) I I can be cynical, but this one... Just because I think, first of all, Luke, he's trying to tell people he loves Julie, which is like kind of out of the, you know, like, I was like, has this ever happened to any of you guys? Or it's like, oh, he's using the love word where I guess it was just sex for Julie. But I just feel for him as if as if loving Julie is going to make the situation better. Please understand. It's not just sex. I love her. But right. But I do. I think there's something about it because I know Chris as a human being and I think he was um, disappointed as well to be written out of the show but I've also God. found out that this character was one of the most difficult ones for Josh to write and mm. and when we talk about showrunners having you know there's a lot of responsibility and and seeing a through line with the character or you know it's saying okay I'm just I don't know what to do for this character anymore or I mean I don't know exactly the details but um he has said that it was one of the more difficult characters for him to write and like what more was that can because I do? he was a, a, the water polo player the very opposite exactly of what he was yeah yeah because it, because <laughs> both my both my boys in fact all my children and my wife and I all played water polo so did you, know, you? Oh, wow. I, I have a lot of sympathy for water polo players. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it, it, it represented the it represented the USC water polo playing guys that he would see at the parties and get Josh. all the girls. Yeah, and couldn't relate to <laughs> right. And but he had said that it was one of the more difficult. But he's also said that in hindsight, he would have loved to have kept um, Luke and Anna and Jimmy around. Um, or yeah. yeah, but but when you when when you realize there's so many. You know, it was the first, his first show, so. Yeah. Now he lives in Santa Barbara. <laughs> Partly. <laughs> Partly, yes. 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 My favorite line of this episode happens in the hospital scene when Luke says, welcome to Portland, bitch. <laughs> 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 it's a little right. ode to our podcast. Yes. As this episode concludes, there's the scene where you straight up blackmail Marissa. Yeah, yeah. I watched that just last night, that scene. Um, yeah, he, what an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty like, you know, Marissa goes in being like, I can finally do something to get my mother back, you know, and she walks in and you're like, I already know everything. But I was questioning, do you think or do you know, did Caleb know about Julian Luke? This gets revealed later oh, later okay. on. Okay. But Just what did you what did you think? I mean, she takes it she takes it at face value. She goes, "Oh, okay." She doesn't. Yeah, she's like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, I guess it's you'd expect um, that Caleb would be an asshole like that, and <laughs> and he did it well. I I I, I was happy with <laughs> what I did because he was really awful. Well, and and I had to look up, and I was like, "This is more like extortion than blackmail." She goes, "Oh, you're going to blackmail mm. me?" And of course, I had to look up the definition. I was like, "Blackmail means that you're going to release information that's embarrassing. Extortion is do this, or I'm going to threat, or I'm threatening you. So I'm threatening your dad mm. by extorting. You know, do this." So I, I was. I don't know. Well, you did look it up. Semantics. <laughs> but, very good. Yes, there's going to be, I think they chose, I think it was a deliberate choice by the writers that Caleb says, oh, I know everything. And for some yeah, reason, I, I think I, it's a I, deliberate I so. choice. Yeah. Yeah, I that think so sense. too. It's interesting because there have been similarities uh, between Dynasty and the OC. My character in Dynasty walks up to the... Um, the lady of the house and says, I know everything. <laughs> so it, 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 it's, I don't know if that's a, th- a throwback to Caleb oh. from the OC um, or not, but you know, I, you just I, know I, everything. I, say, I, I, I know everything. <laughs> you do. So the end of the episode, you know, Ryan takes Marissa back to Jimmy's. Um, and then they're here, Seth and Summer upstairs and they go up and obviously it's the reveal of the room that they've been working on and they transform for her. Um, and it's really sweet, this scene, I thought. And, you know, Marissa's genuinely touched. Yeah, she did a really I, I, she lovely job. I thought Misha was really 
lovely all the way through. It mm-hmm. must have been very hard for her working with all these old people. <laughs> because I mean, even the kids, even the even the kids were old to her. That's true. Yeah, fair. <laughs> it is you know, very fair. She was young, and so yeah, there was a lot. She carried a lot. She did, and I, and I've, I've watched, you know, always watched it closely. And she's a really very fine actor. I, I don't know whether she's carried on um, working or what's happened, but um, she did great work then for a sixteen-year-old or whatever it was. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. When she opens the door and sees this room, and it really is beautiful, and the the wall is the same image as the movie. And I also wanted to point out, is this the first time, because we see Seth actually paint the blue, and of course later on we know that he, he he's an artist with his comics, but and he painted that, but I feel like that's the first time we reveal that Seth is an artist. Does it become a thing? Is it talked well, about he, later? He's he gets in, he draws graphic novel he, characters. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh huh. Yeah. So I thought that was he's yeah, the maybe. artist. And, Good yeah, point. Yeah, but Good I thought point. that was really lovely. But but by accepting shout out to our set painters by the <laughs> right way, yes for that mural. But when she accepts Caleb's proposal, essentially she'll now be this, which is bittersweet. She'll be the princess locked in the tower with with the evil king and queen, and mm. she's. And it's bittersweet because she has this lovely room that that was yeah. given to her by her family, her friends, and right. she, although she can visit it, but I think that's yeah pointed it's out probably she, for sure because as we where know where she would rather be <laughs> yeah she's gonna have to go she and really is the princess locked in the tower in the next season for sure <laughs> yeah. and Summer finds her Care Bear which I love all the ode to you know My Little Pony Care Bears like all of the things that I grew up with as a kid that Josh obviously grew up with as a kid, um, play a very important role <laughs> yeah. in the series. But yeah, and the last shot of Seth, Summer, Ryan, and Marissa on the bed, that's also something I've seen over the years a lot. There's like a still of the four of us on the bed, and it's just like a really sweet, they are all happy, you know, and mm. together. And right. it was a really nice moment at the end of this episode. So, well done, you two, on the proposal. <laughs> You both were fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Oh, you know what? Yes. There was one scene, guys, that I really wanted to oh. make a make a mention of. When Julie yeah. is just rattled, just she's such a narcissist. I'm so glad that her arc changes, but she's <laughs> so involved in the wedding and just completely oblivious and doesn't know about Luke. And when Seth comes in and she's oh, like, yes. Oh, yeah. Must have been like, what a nasty woman. Must have been that divorce he's going through. And Seth goes, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, that's right. And I did, I actually saw, at first it was like, is she like, don't you say anything? But I actually saw some real, some guilt, some some guilt in there, some uncomfortable. Oh, yeah, you were like, oh, shit. I saw that in your face, definitely. There were were, were layers in the acting. Mm -hmm. All layers, sure. yeah. layers of yeah. acting going on. <laughs> there was you know. just well, amazing. <laughs> yeah, like I said, fantastic job this episode. <laughs> yes, <laughs> truly. Of um, Alan, we have some voicemails for you if you don't mind staying around to answer a few fan questions. Sure. Great. We had Maybe a lot we for you. The voicemails. <laughs> we did. We had like an overwhelming response to you. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Wow. Yes. Hi, Mindy and Rachel. This is Bree from Perth, Australia. Um, My question's for Alan Dale. Um, Alan is a New Zealand-born Kiwi. I was wanting to know um, how you find putting on an American accent for your shows. Is there a particular American that you emulate when you um, are doing your scenes? And also, what's with your character always having heart attacks, which I notice (laughs) is um, how they killed off your character in Neighbours, Ugly Betty, and then again in the (laughs) OC? Yes, the heart attacks. (laughs) <laughs> um, we, we've sort of discussed that, but, um, yeah, um, the American accent, well, um, I realize that, you know, what are Americans, uh, I have a little sort of thing, like, for example, when I do a French accent, I have a, a, a sort of thing that I do, you go, do you find that when it rains, your bottom lip fills up with water? <laughs> so that's, that's how I get the French. So how I get the American one is I go, hern, 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 hern. And now I'm ready to talk with American accent. Oh. <laughs> That's sort Good of tricks. The, just Do you do all kinds of accents? Did, did, what, did you have to do something 
Oh, South African. You've done South African. You've done... That was ER. Yeah, that's the first yeah. job I got when I first came. I got a five-episode arc in ER playing a South African surfer with a very bad back uh, <laughs> who comes from Hawaii. And, uh, and I go into the hospital and they paralyze me. So, uh, Man, you've uh, had it rough. <laughs> oh, it's been a tough, a tough career. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name's Leah, and I've been a longtime fan of the OC, and I've been rewatching it, but in high school, I used to watch it all the time. So, and now rewatching it, I just see Caleb's character being so serious all the time, which, of course, that's just who he is in the OC, um, but still has a little bit of, you know, sense of humor. Um, so, I just wanted to see if Alan Dale remembers ever trying to be super serious in the OC, but then um, just breaking because it's just kind of funny because it's just sometimes the storylines like are just hilarious and um, and he's like trying to be the serious one. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering how how he did it to stay in character and stay serious. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I've never thought of him being so serious. I've thought of him having always a bit of a spark in his eye because what mischief can he do now, sort of? Um, um, but we, I mean, you you guys know, we, we broke we broke up many times. That's, yeah. uh, that's, that's part of the fun of, of doing a show like this. And, yeah, I, I, he, as I say, he was my favourite character, I think, I've ever played. There was an episode, I think it was, was it in The Girlfriend, possibly, right in the beginning, where you, I mean, when you make your debut, you're bigger than life, and the, and this orange. just Very awful, <laughs> some of the, the comments are just scathing when it comes to, you make fun of your grandson, and you make fun of Ryan, there's some, there's some that were, like for me, it was, I would giggle because they were so harsh sometimes, but, but Caleb had some of those harsh lines too sometimes. Oh, I, I love those. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, you, yeah, probably I did have trouble keeping a straight face sometimes. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry if it showed through. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like filming The O.C. compared to filming Lost? I loved you in both, but would just love your opinion. Thank you. Love you, Melinda and Rachel. Aw. Hmm. Uh, very sweet. Um. Yeah, well, I, I think I think I told you earlier that you know my wife forgot to pick me up from work one day and I walked home, and that was from the OC. Um, I couldn't do that from Lost because the, it was made in Hawaii. So the downside of that, I had to go to Hawaii all the time, <laughs> about tw twenty trips to Hawaii. To Hawaii. So uh, it was lovely doing Lost. I, I enjoyed it. Um, it was an interesting thing when I was doing Spam a lot in in London. They wanted to shoot some scenes, and they wanted me to fly out to Hawaii, which is a long way from London, mm. and it would have meant taking a week off the show. So I said no. So they brought a crew to London. We shot scenes for Lost in London while I was doing Spam a lot. So all of a sudden, um, what was the name of the character? Yeah, he, he ended up with a beard suddenly because I had a beard <laughs> as, as King Arthur, and so suddenly I woke up one morning with a beard. Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> So, yeah, that was fun. How cool. You're, you're such an inspiration doing, I mean, I, I've had a few times. During the OC, I popped off for a guest star here and there. But it was, but you've done it quite a bit. So if you can do it, we can do it. <laughs> oh, well, it's a let you. I, I, I wasn't allowed to do those things while we were shooting Dynasty. So mm. um, I had to concentrate on being a butler. Right. <laughs> well, and also Liz Gillies just, we just had her on. What a delight. And you just, she got to direct yes. an episode. How's, how's, I mean, we didn't oh. get to ac actually mention that, but what a, what a lovely lady. Oh, she's Loved just, her. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. Talent. Oh Lord. There's right. a, I mean, you walk in the room in like those, those sumptuous sets we have with the grand piano and things, and suddenly, you know, you hear the piano playing, turn around, there she is. And then, you know, um, <sighs> it, it came up that I'd, I'd done Spamalot, and she started singing all the songs from Spamalot. She knows <laughs> – she is just such a huge talent. That's all I can say. Just amazing young yeah. woman. Mm. Did you get to sing on Dynasty? 
to? You no, know, I didn't. And it's, oh. it, they did have a couple of episodes, but they didn't ask me to. I, I'm not sure why. <laughs> Maybe not. But they probably were right. Uh, you know, I did, <laughs> I did sing and spam a lot, but it was sort of talking, singing. Well, when we have our reunion, which we, because we keep talking when, when, when it's safe and everyone's in the same mm-hmm. uh, city, we, we are, we're talking about having some kind of get together and we would love to see you as well. You and your lovely, oh, absolutely I'd love to join you guys. Yeah, yeah thank it was you. so nice catching up with you and seeing you, and and all yeah. your accomplishments are just very admirable and amazing. Thank so you. thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Rach. We have, Thanks, it, and God. hopefully, we've got more coming up with Kayla. We've got a lot of juicy storyline coming up with uh-huh. uh, with your character. So if you if you come back, we'll have you. <laughs> all right, thank you, Don girls. Thank you so much for listening. Follow, rate, and review Welcome to the OC Bitches wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you like to watch us, check it out on YouTube or on HBO Max. Please leave those reviews and let us know more about what you want to hear. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to start with the pilot episode and catch all of our episode recaps.